before we look at God's word together this morning, I wanted to share with you something that came into my mind as I studied this passage this last week, which was that often I find when reading the scriptures, and I'm sure that you do too, that it is just when God's people are doing the best, when victory is had, and there is great prosperity, that there is likewise great opportunity for sin to take root. When victories are abounding and there is wonderful success, even in the Lord, the people of God, if they're not careful, can begin to lose focus, become lethargic, even begin to attribute, attribute their own or the success they experience to themselves as opposed to God. It reminds me of King David. There were battles won and he had great victory. It was all accomplished. He was at the height of conquest in the Lord. And then what happened? Comes back to the kingdom and he got lazy. He didn't go out with his men to continue to battle. Instead of being off to war, he was sitting around Jerusalem rewarding himself and would eventually commit adultery with another man's wife whom he would kill and hardly realize that he was in sin. And Satan knows this, I think, when God's people are beginning or can at least begin to lose focus and fix themselves on themselves and not on God's. It's a great opportunity for him to tread the name of God when everybody's watching, right? When the victory is seemingly sure, and it is in Christ. But this is when he seems to strike, when he whispers and deceives. And it's a real tragedy. And it's a tragedy in a sense that we're going to witness even from our own passage this morning as we consider what God's been doing through the narrative of Acts the church is at a high point here. The Spirit has been poured out. There's been great and awesome manifestations of God, people coming in day by day to the number of God's people in the church and works and miracles. And even in the midst of persecution of people that are persevering by God's grace and the Spirit being poured out to give them further boldness. Just like last week, a abundantly generous people even in the power of God, selling their entire properties and then giving the proceeds to those who had need. I mean, this is a prosperous, thriving church in the work of God. But we see at the height of this great work, for some at least, this focus would be drawn away and sin would begin to take root. So this morning, I want to turn your attention to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, certainly a very notable pair in the narrative. And what we'll look at is the detail of their egregious hypocrisy this morning and the deceit of these two church members and even the disastrous consequences that unfurled as a result. So let's look to the word of God together, brothers and sisters, verses 36, or we'll look at verse 36 at the end of chapter 4 together and read on. It says, Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it, re while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. 
and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Would you just take a moment to bow your heads with me and pray? Lord, gracious God, we ask this morning for your blessing upon your word. We ask this morning that we would consider these weighty things with soft and tender hearts. We pray that you would make the ears of this people receptive to your word and pierce where you would pierce the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I want to work our way together through this narrative a little bit chronologically this morning. There's a lot for us to examine, and I want to make some conclusions throughout as we do that, Then we'll end with some application. But I want to begin with where the Scripture begins for us, with what I call a positive example of generosity. And this is what we see in verses 36 and 37, right at the end of chapter 4. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. If you were with us last week, we examined the theme of generosity and the abundant generosity that was taking place in the church as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Disciples in the church were selling their properties. What they had and laying the proceeds at the feet of the apostles, declaring with one voice, what we have is common. Everything in common to be shared. Miraculous, abundant generosity was taking place. It was an incredible example of church love. And so it comes, the text brings us to here, Joseph, or an example of Joseph. It says, thus, Joseph, flowing out of this event of abundant generosity, we have his example, or as the apostles call him, Barnabas, man of encouragement. And Joseph exemplified this behavior. He was meant to be an example for the rest of the church to see this is what it looks like. Look, this man in particular sold his entire property and took the proceeds, laid it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed among the church. So we have initially a positive example, joyful, great example of what truly abundant generosity looked like. And this makes that story so tangible, so real, right? It gives it a a, a, a realistic nature to us to see that the scriptures remembered the name of one man in particular but in the Holy Spirit's wisdom that would go down in history for the Christian church as one who sold what he had for the church. An incredible work of generosity. A caretaker to God's people, worthy to be honored and remembered for his work. So we have first the positive example of generosity. But as the scripture moves on, the Holy Spirit and his wisdom wanted us to remember another example. And one that was not positive in generosity, but was of a false variety. And this is where we're led to the example of Ananias and Sapphira for what I'm calling the scheme of Ananias and Sapphira. Listen, as the transition is great. 
chapter 5, it says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we have the scheme of Ananias and Sapphira in contrast to the example of abundant generosity in Joseph. Now, they sold a property too. There's some similarity, right? I mean, they they gave up what was rightfully theirs, and they sold it and gained proceeds from it. And at least on the outset, initially, we see them showing incredible generosity with what they had. They took it, and they brought it to the apostles' feet. It looks like, on the surface, an incredible commitment to the body of Christ, like Joseph or like others. But this is a surface-level commitment. Their plan with the proceeds from the sale was rotten. It was deceitful. Right? They kept it back. It says that Ananias with his wife sold the property and even with her knowledge kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only that part before the apostles. So what we're seeing here is a complete front. It's a fake. It's a rouse. They had schemed about it together. They were going to sell their property just like the rest of the Christians, and they'd give the money to the church and lay it at the feet of the apostles, except like they both agreed they would only be a portion of the sale amount. A sizable portion would still be a lot of money. But the rest they were going to keep for themselves. The question we begin to ask, even as we initially read this, is why? Why would Ananias and Sapphira do this? I mean, what motivated them to to go this far and then fall short and be so deceitful with the rest of the funds? If you're going to go to all that trouble, was it really worth it? Well, I want to just mention a couple motives that I think are below the surface for Ananias and Sapphira's work here. And chiefly, and I think principally, it is the praise of man. They wanted the praise of man. Ananias and Sapphira wanted Christian accolade. They wanted notoriety for their work. Right? They wanted to be received with adoration from the rest of the church for this noble service. Right? I mean, it is. I mean, last week we spent time really standing in awe of the, the greatness of this work. I mean, to give up your entire property and to take the proceeds and to lay them willingly at the apostles' feet happily and joyfully. Yeah, that's a great work. But these were focused on a different motive, the motive of people's adoration. And I like what Matthew Henry says of these two. He says that they were ambitious of being thought eminent disciples and of the first rank, right? The top rank, notable among the rest, going down in history, first rank disciples held in high esteem. Not just the single regular member of the body of Christ. I mean, no doubt they probably witnessed how much adoration would be received by those who would give up so much in the church. And they wanted it. They wanted to look like genuine, noteworthy disciples of God. But in reality, it was a lie. It was a farce. Denying the truth about what they gave to look generous and to look ultra holy in the face of the church of Jesus Christ. And this was a work of hypocrites. This was the work of pretenders. Professing to be what they were not, or as the scriptures say, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, they hid hid the truth about their gift from the apostles. This kind of godless and worldly desire was the mark of deceivers. It is the mark of deceivers. So they wanted the praise of man. That was their first motive, I believe. They wanted the accolade of the rest of the church and the people would see this great work. But I think they were also motivated by greed. By greed, an exorbitant love of money. And they'd say an inordinate love of money. Couldn't just give it all away. Right? It was too hard. They wanted to hold on to some, keep a little extra. I mean, how bad would it be? It would be difficult to be forced to live on so much less, and so let's keep a little bit for ourselves. 
How could it be wrong to withhold a little? Well, it would have been different if they actually told the truth about what they actually kept to themselves, I believe. But they were devious about it. And they hid it from the apostles because they desperately wanted some of that money for themselves. And they didn't want the apostles to know how desperately they wanted that money. And so they would hide it. They would lie about it. Because that they still love the things of this world. So it was the praise of man. And it was the love of money that motivated them. And these, I think, were two underlying motives that gave birth to this dreadfully poor decision of Ananias and Sapphira. And next, I want to consider Peter's indictment, because this is powerful. These are incredible, pointed words of rebuke and reproval that end in disaster for Ananias and Sapphira. So we have to spend some time here. Peter's indictment against Ananias. As an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, certainly one, we must remember, who held unique authority and who held unique comprehension of the revelation of God. The Lord was speaking through this man to write down and pen the words of Holy Scripture. Peter would have a special awareness in the Holy Spirit of the hypocrisy of this man, Ananias, and certainly his wife, Sapphira. And as we're going to see, he had much of the power of God to say about this evil. So let's look at verses 3 through 4. This is Peter's response to their deceit. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. It's pointed words. So Peter starts here with a question of Ananias. Why, Peter, has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds? Now, we're going to talk about that whole phrase, but I want to just camp out for a moment on why, Peter, has Satan filled your heart? Satan himself. Now, this deed, I think what he's saying is it's from the pit of hell, right? It's demonic. It's dark. It's insidious. It's evil in its action. Peter's saying, Ananias, this is the influence of Satan himself in you. And the word for filled is interesting. It's the exact same root Greek word that's used in Ephesians 5.18 when believers are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be under his sway, right? Led by his power, influenced by his will. Ananias and Sapphira's scheme here was pure evil. And they were inspired, you could say, by the by Satan to do it. They weren't possessed. I think that's an entirely different word in Scripture. But their hearts, you could say, had become totally swayed by evil desires and devices, the likes of which Peter could sniff out a mile away. Who else but Satan would want to commit such treason against the church, commit injustice to the body, lie to the Spirit of God, this is the kind of stuff of the ancient serpent. And you can't miss something else important here. Ananias, it says, is still responsible for the lie. Right? Peter says in verse 4, he says, Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Your heart. Inspired of Satan from the pit of hell, this is evil, as evil as it comes, but it's your evil, Peter. You're responsible. You're the one that's contrived it. Ananias is still held responsible for the lie. The evil source came from him. It came from him alone. There's no room for, well, the devil made me do it. Right? It's somebody else. Outside force of power. No. It was his selfish yearnings, his own evil inclinations and cravings that gave rise to this egregious, egregious action. 
And it makes me think of Jesus' words when he taught about the heart. And the heart as the source of all evil. He says, out of the heart, Jesus' words, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. We can't say when we've sinned, it's the devil. We can't say it's exterior force. We can't say it's the ill experiences of somebody else's sin in my life that causes me to sin. There is no excuse. No excuse. Whether it's somebody filled with Satan or somebody who has experienced the sin of someone else, we are held responsible for sin. And Peter was. Despite what influences lies and deceit, brethren, the devil exercises, hear me on this, he is only working with what was there in the first place in us. He is only ever working with what's already there, seeking to just fan the flame of our worldly and egregious passions and desires. So Ananias was the perpetrator of this evil, and he'd be responsible for it. Now, it was certainly a very unique evil, brothers and sisters, very unique evil. And that's the next, and one of, I think, the most important aspects of Peter's indictment against Ananias. And I want to prioritize this point for a moment. Ananias's great sin, which is, as Peter describes, lying to the Holy Spirit. Lying to the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the the land? You lied, Ananias. You lied to the Holy Spirit, keeping back part of the proceeds, claiming that he had brought forth the entire sum, blatantly hiding the truth from the apostles. This was the heights of his facade for the purpose of, as we've already studied, appearing ultra-righteous, Ananias deceived. But we need to remember his deceit was not just merely towards the apostles. This was, this was not just a sin towards church leaders. And this was directly opposed to God himself. His deceit was towards God. As Peter later says to Ananias, you have not lied to man. You have lied to God. Hey, this isn't between us necessarily. It's between you and God. And that's such an interesting statement. For a few reasons. This is an assertion of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Right Right here we get get a little inkling or a, a little snippet of the Scripture's position of the Holy Spirit as divine. Not an impersonal force, right? Not some vain wind. He carries the title of God himself, equal in divinity, the third member of the triune God. And therefore... A statement of the incredibly grievous nature of Ananias' sin. Because he was deliberately trying to deceive God to his face. That's That's what Peter says you're doing. You're marching right up into the face of God and lying to him. Coming before the authorities of Christ's church thinking he could get away with his own conjured story. Peter adds, even to this indictment, his total folly for such a decision. Because it was his property in the first place. He could have done what he wanted with his own property. He had the right to do as he saw fit. He could have, he could have brought the exact same sum before the apostles. And there would have been nothing wrong with that. But the problem was he lied about it. He lied to God for personal gain. Parading himself, dropping it down at the apostles' feet like no one would ever find out. And that's just it. This sin is especially egregious because of the sheer audacity of it. It's a mockery of God. He was bold enough to stand before the Holy Spirit, blatantly lie about what he was giving, lay it at the apostles' feet, seeming super righteous, foolish enough to think, that he could escape, but no. What we see here, God would not be fooled. God would not be mocked by this kind of lie. 
These two may have thought they could pull the wool over the eyes of everyone else. Maybe they did, but they couldn't do it with God. God would not be deceived. God knew. He saw. He heard. God would deal with it accordingly. Which is my next point. God's swift justice. His swift, and you can even say terrible justice. Terrifying. Awful. God's retribution here is swift and it is severe. Death. He took Ananias' life right on the spot. Same thing with Sapphira. The Lord did not take this kind of sin lightly. He would not endure such confident displays of trickery towards himself. He ended Ananias' life as a display of his holy disposition towards sin. No more chances. That's it. It would not be allowed to endure any longer. It's in God's power to give life, and it is in God's power to take it away. As we look at this, I want to reread verses 5 through 6. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. We must remember, beloved, that God is a God of judgment. God is a God of judgment. I think this is one of the biggest points the many in the modern church seek to put away and to hide. Let's not talk about that. It's too oppositional, right? It's offensive. But nonetheless, we see on the pages of God's word, the truth, which is gloriously true, that God is a God of judgment. He's righteous altogether. In his power, God is vehemently opposed to all evil with perfect righteous indignation. In the Psalms, we read that, that God has bent his bow. He has wet his sword. He is ready to deal out just retribution against the wicked who refuse to repent. You go on in the Psalms, it says that God is angry with the wicked every single day. God is a God of judgment. And his wrath, his just perfect anger is weighted exactly and it is terrible beyond comprehension. Just like the scripture says, to fall into the hands of the living God is a fearful thing. It's a terrifying thing. So this shows us the judgment of God. It shows us the swift and severe judgment of God. But I know the question arises when we think of the severity of God's judgment. What about the eternal state of Ananias and Sapphira? Right? Right? Considering the severity of God's judgment, were they saved or were they damned in their death? Now, we have to take a few scriptural variables to come to a conclusion here. We have to begin with something I think that scripture teaches actually clearly, which is that God's people, hear me, church, God's people can be disciplined unto death. God's people can absolutely be disciplined unto death. We have an example of this in 1 Corinthians. Here where the church is participating in the Lord's table, and they're doing so in such an unworthy manner that it says that some have fallen ill and others have even died, perished as a result. And speaking of the church's experience of this, Paul writes when he talks about this, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Their illness in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this church that was had an ill practice around the Lord's table, their illness and death, it says, is for redemptive purposes. It was a chastening of God's people so that they wouldn't be condemned, ultimately. So God, we can say, has, he can and has, brought death to his own as a consequence of their sin, and even to protect them from the ultimate dire consequences 
of sin, delivering them from, you could say, further ruin of their own soul. But do I think that Ananias and Sapphira knew the Lord? I would say I don't. I don't think they knew the Lord. As opposed to the first Corinthian example, I see here no scriptural indication that the Lord's judgment was for redemptive purposes. Rather, I see a context that shows uh, quite the opposite, a heinous nature of sin and the swift vengeance of God as a result. It's almost identical to what happens in Joshua 7 with Achan and his sin, hiding away the items uh, from Jericho that were put apart for destruction, ultimately even causing the nation of Israel to fall short in battle with their enemies. And what happened with this man? Well, he lied. He hid them away. And it resulted in his and his own family's stoning immediately. Now, I will say this. I am in no way the infallible voice on this subject. Absolutely not. And what is not indefinitely, or definitely, I should say, clearly spoken, we have to do our best to ascertain from the Scripture by principle. And this is my conclusion. I do not think we can be perfectly certain, brothers and sisters, but I think in that, I would say it gives us more pause in its application for us, doesn't it? One thing can be certain, brothers and sisters, from this, is the purposes behind God's judgment. Okay, this can be absolutely certain. That he would be feared. That God would be feared by the world and his people in his judgment, swift and severe. The Lord despises sin. He would have you and I and the church understand and grasp that. It says here that great fear came upon all who heard. Even later, verse 11, it says it came upon the whole church. God is teaching. He was teaching, reminding his people about sin and its consequences. God's word said elsewhere, for those who are coming near to him, he will be sanctified. That means he will be considered holy. He will not be considered trite and menial. He will be considered set apart, sanctified and holy, uncomparable in glory and purity. Ananias and Sapphira served as an example to the rest of the church for this very reason, that we would not consider him otherwise than he actually is. So in the story, we come now to Sapphira, or as I've mentioned in my notes and on your sheet, um, Sapphira's condemnation. This is going to be a little bit smaller, but nonetheless important for us to go over. So we read what happens after this death of Ananias in verse 7 and onward. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who've heard of these things. So like her husband before her, Sapphira follows suit, sharing the exact same fate. Three hours after the burial of Ananias, Sapphira steps in to speak with the apostles. And what's interesting is it says she didn't know what happened. She had no clue. Not knowing what had happened. So clearly news of her husband's death had not yet reached her ear. She had no idea that just a few short moments, time a little bit ago, their plan had totally failed and consequences were dire for their evil. 
So Peter proceeds to speak to Sapphira about the price of the property. Whether you sold the land for so much, what did you sell it for, Sapphira? What was the price, the true price? He gave the value of the property and even offered something that uh, Ananias didn't even have, which is opportunity to tell the truth just for a moment to turn around and make the story right before the Lord. But that was in vain, as we see. Sapphira confirms the same value as Ananias. Concealing the truth from God, like her husband, and sealing her own judgment. And Peter declares a similar indictment. He says in verse 9, How is it that you've agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you you out they agreed to do what is evil and they were of the same mind and that which was wrong as if peter was saying you ought to have sapphira turned away from this wickedness right you also you ought to have disagreed you ought to have not done the same thing and we know a wife should submit to her husband but a little note here, she cannot do so in ways of sin. There ought to be disagreement on that front when it comes to rebellion against God. It would have been righteousness for Sapphira to say no before the Lord. But she agreed. She was of one mind to sinful, wicked desire, making it all the more egregious before the Lord, testing the spirit, seeing how far they could get away with their sin, their flagrant sin, without any divine intervention. But we see, brethren, it is too far. It is too far. And Peter, this time, even announces the judgment of God upon Sapphira, saying, you will die in like manner. Looked at the feet of those who buried your husband. They're about to carry you out. She falls and breathes her last. Before I continue, I think there's a particular lesson here for husbands, and I'll just be brief. This is an example of the awful consequences, men, of bad leadership, bad, rotten leadership in the home. This may be something of what can happen. This may be something of the toll that it can take upon a home, upon a wife. Now, I know. Sapphira made this decision on herself. She, Peter rebuked her for it. So said, why, why? Why have you agreed with your husband on this front? But in verse 2, note something, and I'm jumping back again, but verse 2, it says that Ananias kept back for himself some of the proceeds. Not for both. He kept for himself the proceeds. Yeah, with his wife's knowledge, but it was for himself. You see the motive there? It was self-gratification. It was for him. He wanted it. At least part of this horrible result had something to do with this man's failure in the home, his selfish, me-gratifying leadership. It's very reminiscent of the garden, isn't it? Forsaking a call to godly, self-sacrificial governing of the home for the service of me, prioritizing my needs, my wants, this people, this family is for me. And I'll say, it at least ought to give us pause, men of God. It should give us pause to consider the weight of our responsibility, the weight and the impact of failure and abdication of our roles. Our entire families can be destroyed in one or another ways. And if they're not utterly destroyed or left broken, they may sooner or later follow suit with our sin, follow our own pattern of wickedness. Let's be mindful, men. We must be mindful of that call. Now I want to take the rest of our time to consider what this teaches us, church what we should learn from the example of Ananias and Sapphira. What lessons 
do we have? If we haven't already read through the lines of some of those lessons, I, I want to bring them to our attention. So this is the point where you ought to lend your ear specifically because there are specific things we must consider from the example of Ananias and Sapphira. Firstly, we must remember the holiness of God. Brothers and sisters, we must remember the holiness of God. It's quite central. Ananias and Sapphira treated God as neutral, as lesser, trivial or common, you could even say. That God would have little thought to the sins of his people. He'd be uh, unconcerned about what they were doing in the context of the church. But that was a fatal mistake. It was a fatal mistake of them or, or those even before them, Nadab and Abihu, right? Who offered strange fire, thinking I can offer something even more holy than God would say. Right? I can, I can make the worship what I want. No, God is holy, church. God is holy. God is separate. God is other. He is immaculate. He is infinite in his otherness. Scripture tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light. You can call that fatal purity, right? Fatal purity. He is of such immaculate righteousness that it can kill a man to come before him. It exposes who they are, drops them dead in a moment. And we are not like God. And I must say this. We are not like him in that way. In Christianity, certainly, in the grace of the gospel, it's different. But ponder what I'm saying. We're children of dust. We are marred by the fall. We are stained by sin. And so to act in relation to God in a manner that treats him as lesser or trivial is a dreadful mistake. It is a dreadful wrong. And we are called to fear the Lord, to reverence him in his glory and in his majesty, to tremble at his word. This is why the picture of men falling prostrate before God gives us that picture. It's said so often in scripture because that is the immediate response when coming close to the presence of God, the weight of his glory, the exposure of our sin. Oh, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips, Isaiah says, dwelling among a people of unclean lips. What happens when we come before God, tore apart by his righteousness, his glory? We must fear God. We are warned of the consequences of sin because God is not far off. God is in no way unconcerned about our actions. And when we think about the worship of God, sincerity is not going to cut it. Sincerity doesn't work. Uzzah was sincere when he placed his hand upon the ark to stabilize it in order that it wouldn't fall off the cart and into the dirt. He was sincere. Well, he may have been sincere, but he was not concerned about God's holiness, his purity, what God actually demanded. And God, I say again, will be sanctified among those who draw near to him. He will be considered holy to those who approach him. And praise God, we can approach him. In the grace of Jesus Christ, we can. And so the question we must ponder when it comes to the holiness of God is, how do we act when we come before him? What do we say when we pray? When we worship, what are we doing? What defines our worship and its parameters? What is our posture? on the Lord's Day, in the church of Jesus Christ. Are all of these practices, brothers and sisters, in some ways marked by the holiness of our God? Right? Are they colored with our perspective of the God we serve and how holy he is? Or are they marked in the opposite by our progressively sin softened character character caricature of who he is a wrong understanding a lesser god so that's my first point remember the holiness of god 
Now, secondly, beware of hypocrisy. Beware of hypocrisy. Beware, congregation, of trying to look or be or act in a manner not consistent. Saying you are something when you are actually not. Ananias and Sapphira were just putting on a show. They're trying to be what they weren't by big, large scale acts of benevolence, right? Putting on a display for the church. And they were looking, they were trying to look the part by other means, yearning to be acclaimed and accredited by counterfeit. But they were just another brand of Pharisee. They were just another version of a Pharisee. On the outside, cleaning the cup, right? Praying in public to be seen, giving to the needy to be praised. But what's on the inside? Dead men's bones right? Whitewashed tomb. And just like back then, this can be the same today. This can be the exact same thing in the church today. God's warning is standing for us, for those that, like Ananias in Sapphira, fake Christianity. And we must notice something about this kind of hypocrisy. It is to the general eye, virtually indistinguishable. Hard to tell, right? It looked on the surface like they were anybody else. They did these great deeds. It's hard to tell. I mean, maybe their theology's right. The vernacular is accurate. They, they, they do these great and overt acts of righteousness, but like tares in a field of wheat, like tares in a field of wheat, they are pretending what we're learning from this part of the story, church, also, is the motives for hip hypocrites are often the same, right? The same fuel, right? The same urgings, yearnings. They want to be venerated, right? They want to be honored above the rest. They want the position. They want the notoriety. And they go to great and even devious lengths to get this. But in fact, they have to work very, very, very hard to keep up a facade, right? but only in the public square, right? It's when nobody else can see that the truth comes out. And the scriptures teach us a little bit else, a little bit more about the motives, or you could say the aspects of a hypocrite. They don't own up to their own sin. They will never admit their own fault. They are judgmental of other people, particularly in the context of the church, but not themselves. They make extra biblical demands of others that they do not place upon their self. They have those expectations. And like we've seen, they want glory for themselves, even at the sake of God. They pretend about their righteousness and sanctification. They hide sin. Sometimes they're experts at doing so. That's the reason why Jesus Christ is God seen through it, see through the falsity. So I say this, hypocrite in the church, be warned by the word of God today. Be warned by the example of Ananias and Sapphira of the end that is common to hypocrites. You may be indistinguishable for a time, but you need to hear what this is telling us, that you will only be indistinguishable for a time. It can only last for a short period. Sooner or later, the truth is going to come to the surface. Right? You can't hide it any better than Ananias and Sapphira. And they sold their own property. God sees hypocrisy. God sees it. He knows it. He's aware of it in his
We end on my last application point. The last thing I want you to consider is this. To seek the Lord while he may be found. Praise God. To seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Seek the Lord. Return to him. He will have compassion. He will abundantly pardon. God is ready to have mercy. God is always ready with mercy. To those who find themselves given to the same inclinations, God is ready to forgive. God is ready to pardon. He is ready to pardon those who turn from their deceit, turn from their hypocrisy, and turn unto his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe it's not even the example of Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit, trying to be something you're not, but maybe it's overt sin in your life with no victory, no change, no repentance. Well, here it is. You who fit that category, turn. Turn unto the Lord. He is a gracious God. He is loving to the undeserving. He is generous to the repentant. His son took that payment. Jesus Christ hung for, from the cross, pinned with nails, waited under the curse of the Father himself for hypocrites, for his own hypocrites. For those that in their life were like Saul then Paul, seen their sin chief among them and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. His mercy, his sacrifice, his resurrection is evidence of his willingness to pardon those who are of the most egregious sort. Jesus drank their hell at Calvary, crying out, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And maybe you're here this morning and you didn't know the extent of the sin that's in your heart. Maybe this morning you've been made aware of your hypocrisy or the sin that keeps dragging you down. What you're hiding from everybody else, the falsity, right? The facade you're putting on. Well, here's the word. Time is short. Make amends with God. Take him at this word. While he may be found... Throw yourself upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Experience his mercy. Receive his pardon. His death and resurrection have accomplished it. So flee, 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 flee while the Lord is near, while you have time, before it's too late, before you have your last chance. Do not be like Ananias and Sapphira. Do not find yourself there because it will be too late. You may hear those kind of words in this life. You may hear them upon your last breath when you come before the presence of God. Oh, God is rich in mercy. He is rich in mercy. Steadfast in love, pardoning, forgiving thousands. But remember, he will not let the wicked go unpunished. Church, what a God we serve. You have to pause on that again today. What a God we serve. We should fill that position, shouldn't we? We should be struck dead on the spot for our sin. But oh, for the grace of Jesus Christ. What a king, what a Christ. He would take such heinous sin upon his shoulders for us. So let this word exhort you, exhort us. To turn, reject sin, have enough of it, put it to death by the grace of God, fear God, look to his holiness, admire and worship him with reverent joy, reverent joy and a sincere heart.
Amen. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Oh, Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your immeasurable grace to us. Oh, I pray for the heart of those today who are in our midst, who feel, feel the weight of sin on their shoulders, who feel, God, the impact of the example of Ananias and Sapphira. Lord God, do a work ushering them to the grace of your son, his willingness to pardon. God, we pray that there would be a healthy burden for this sin that would lead to great joy in the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In his name we pray, amen.